Well, good day everyone tuning in to our sermon on 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 3 to 8. And I've entitled this sermon, Sexual Purity in a Sex-Crazed World. We'll look at the passage, read it, prayer, go into prayer, and then we will get into God's word. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to conduct his body in holiness and in honor, not in passionate of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter, because the Lord is the avenger of all these things, as we told you before, hand and solemnly warned you. For God has not called us to impurity, but in holiness. Therefore, any whoever disregards this disregards not man but God who gives his Holy Spirit to you let's pray father in heaven we praise you you're a holy God you avenge sin but you're also a gracious God who calls people to himself to enjoy you I thank you for such a work of grace that you've done through the Lord Jesus in Spirit of God, we praise you that we are given you from God. You're a gift from God to empower us. And even now as we look into your word, we pray that by your Holy Spirit, we would be empowered to your glory. In Jesus' good name, amen. 2020 was a very hard year for celebrity Christians, celebrity pastors. For instance, we had a celebrity pastor who was very famous. He ministered to famous people. Famous people went to his church. He was even on Oprah. But unfortunately, he was caught in the act of adultery and had to resign. We also had a celebrity president of the largest Christian school in North America who had a great fall. It was exposed that him and his wife were involved in sexual immorality. We also had a very good apologetics preacher who spoke to millions of people and encouraged millions to look to Christ and pointed them to Christ. He was exposed as a person who committed sexual harassment and texted very inappropriate things to people. I have purposely not named any of these people because my job is not to mudsling or think that any of us are better than them, but we want to focus on what God's Word says. We have to say it out loud. Sexual immorality is a problem in our culture and a problem in the church. When we have three famous people who have been esteemed for years and they crumble and fall, we need to look inward. We can stop looking at them and even thinking about them. We have to look inward and examine how we're doing in this area. Not that I'm accusing anybody of anyone. But let us be a people who always stand upon the grace of Christ, who stand upon the word of God, and are habitually confessing our sins. We are now in this new section of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, where Paul is dealing with the things and the issues that are going on in the church that are lacking in their faith. Paul here actually deals with about 19 issues that are lacking in their faith, and 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and 5, Paul deals with sexual immorality, love, the second coming of Jesus, avoiding all evil, thankfulness, laziness, and a sorts of, all sorts of other things. Paul starts this section like we talked about last time in chapter 4 with a finally then. He's changing the topic. And that then points us back to what Paul has previously said in this letter going back to the grace of God. Finally, therefore, they're to live lives of holiness because of the grace of God. Remember, Paul thanks God three times for the Thessalonians, God's life-transforming work among them. And again, we see that gospel life transformation or people's lives being changed by Jesus depends 100% upon God and His work through Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. And this is why Paul gives thanks to God three times. Chapter 1, verse 4, they're called 
They're loved. God put his love perfectly upon them. Because of the grace of God, they and we are able to walk in God and walk in ways that please God. Paul asks and urges them to live in that grace and that grace enables them to live a holy life. In chapter 4, verse 2, these instructions, although they came from Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, they're through the Lord Jesus. So all these commands from chapters 4 to 5 have their authority in the Lord Jesus. And so now we can tackle this first topic that is lacking in their faith. It's all important, especially in the sex-crazed world that we're in. First, in verses 3 to 5 of chapter 4, we want to know God's will for our life. In chapter 4, verse 6, we want to know that the Lord avenges God's punishment. In verse 3, we're going to look at God's call. God's called us to holiness. So let's look at the will of the Lord. God's will, verses 3 to 5. He starts out saying, For this is the will of God, your sanctification. The for here goes back to what Paul has previously said about these instructions. Paul asks and urges in the Lord. Paul calls them to live their life to please God. These instructions come from the Lord. And because these instructions are in the Lord and through the Lord Jesus, you need to know the will of God for your life is your holiness. God's will is that they live holy lives. Paul later says that the will for them as well is to overflow in thankfulness in 1 Thessalonians 5.18. But this brings me back to discussing and discovering what is the will of God for my life. I know in youth group years ago, we would hear many speakers come in and they'd speak about, you need to find the will of God for your life. I remember certain speakers treating the will of God as something that was kind of lost and we just needed to have the faith to find the will of God. And lo and behold, it was actually right before our eyes in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3 and 5, verse 18 the whole time. The will of God for your life. The desire for the Lord for His people is to live lives of holiness. This is yet another reason why holiness is not an option and it's serious business with the Lord because it's the will of the Lord for our lives if we're in Christ. Christians are those who belong to the family of God and because they belong to the family of God they're to do the will of their Father. And this is exactly what Jesus says. His, his family members are coming to him in the Gospel of Matthew and they want to speak to him. And Jesus, this is what he says about his family. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother, sister, and mother. Well, what does Paul mean when he speaks of your sanctification or your holiness? The word here means to be set apart, to be different, even to be other than. And just to note, this same word that is used here in verse 3, sanctification, is also used in verse 4, although the ESV translates it holiness. It's also used in verse 7, and it's translated holiness. But this word, sanctification, holiness, holiness, Verse 3, 4, and 7 is the same word. Like we've said before in many other sermons, we can do nothing to make ourselves holy, blameless, sanctified before God. Nothing. This is a work of 100% of the Lord Jesus. 1 Corinthians 1.30, and it says, And because of Him, that's God, because of God, you are in Christ Jesus. The grace of God brings you to that relationship with Jesus Christ who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness, 
and sanctification, which is that same word holiness, and redemption. Jesus Christ has made us sanctified or holy in God's sight, and it's all God's grace. So we're, we're in the Lord Jesus, and we, we've received the grace of the Lord Jesus. When the Father looks upon us, he sees Christ's holiness. We are now holy and blameless in the sight of God. So because of the Christian, the work of Christ, that through grace, they are holy in the sight of God. But the holiness that Paul is referring to here is not referring to our positional holiness. Yes, if you're in Christ, you are holy in God's sight, free from accusation. Meaning that although we're sinners, we're saved by grace, we're pure and holy in the sight of God the Father, we as well must day by day progress, become more holy by the power of the Holy Spirit whom God gives us. This is basic Christian living of putting to death sin by the grace of God. I hope every believer listening to this can say about themselves, I'm not what I ought to be. Because you're not perfect yet. You haven't gone to glory. I'm not what I ought to be, but thank God I'm not what I used to be by God's grace because God has sanctified you day by day. You become more like Jesus Christ, more holy. That's God's will, that we become more holy. Put to death sin. What else does he say here? That you abstain from sexual immorality. This word abstain really has the idea of keeping a distance from sexual immorality. I remember a funny story of a guy in southern Ontario who kind of, he annoyed people. And when people wanted to get rid of him and they didn't want to see him for a while, they'd lend him $20 and then they would see what would happen. So the borrower would usually see the person who was the loan shark. He would walk and avoid them on the other side of the street. He would keep a distance. This person kept a distance from the lender because he didn't want to pay the money back. He kept a distance. He didn't want anything to do with the person who loaned him money. This is, uh, this is uh, what we ought to be doing with sexual immorality, but also anything that leads to sexual immorality, keeping a distance. Well, we need to define sexual immorality because for some people, sexual immorality is just committing habitual adultery. That's what some people think it is. I remember I had a guy to try and convince me that committing adultery once wasn't a big deal, but it's just when you commit it all the time, it's a big deal. That was his line. You can do it once, twice, three, but just, just don't do it too much. That's maybe some people in our culture's view of sexual immorality. But a quick definition of sexual immorality, according to God, is sexual activity out of God's design for marriage. What's God's design for marriage? One biological male, one biological female, in the confines of marriage to till death do them part. But sexual immorality in the New Testament can be defined as well as same-sex intimacy, premarital sexual intimacy, or sexual intimacy with someone who is married to someone else. Leviticus as well speaks about other things that are described in the Bible as sexual immorality in Leviticus 18, 6-23. Israel, though, it, it, there in Leviticus 18, was called to be holy and avoid the practices of the pagan nations around them. These types of sins and things that lead to them, we must distance ourselves from, meaning we must flee from them. So just so you know, just for idea of context, Paul is writing Thessalonians from Corinth. And so this issue of sexual immorality would have been up front and center for him, just like kind of in his face. It was going on all over. Paul, when he speaks to the Corinthian church on this very topic, says something very similar. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18 and 20. 
flee from sexual immorality. And he goes to verse 19, 619. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You're not your own. For you were bought with a price. The price was Christ Jesus. Dying in your place, you could be free from sin. In the end, so glorify God in your body. They were called to be at a distance with these sexual sins. They were called to flee with regards to these sexual sins. They were called to keep away or refrain and abstain from sexual sins by the power of the Holy Spirit and by the grace of God. He continues on in verse 4 of chapter 4. That each of you know how to control his body in holiness and honor. Again, this is something that we might need some context to understand why Paul is saying these things. You might remember that Thessalonica was a port city. Uh, particularly, port cities were very bad with regards to sexual immorality. You had people kind of away from home, traveling, and they maybe they were staying there, and they had desires that they thought needed to be fulfilled. And so it would have been an environment of sexual immorality. Well, there's a famous quote by a man named Athenaeus. And hear what he says about the culture of places like Corinth and Thessalonica. We keep mistresses for pleasure, concubines for the day-to-day -day needs of the body, but we have wives in order to produce children legitimately and to have a trustworthy guardian of our homes if I was advocating for that, that would be a, multi, a massive Me Too moment. But this was the culture of Thessalonica of Corinth. Basically, women there for sexual pleasure and to take care of the home and bring you children. So this is the environment in Thessalonica that people would have been accustomed to. But following the Lord means that we are separate from the world. These Christians were called to live their lives in holiness, holy living, and honor to God. They were called to live holy as God is holy and live in ways that gave glory to God. They were not to live in a manner that, where they were uncontrolled, but to be in control of their desires and passions to the glory of God. And he continues this on in verse 5, Not in passionate lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. If we live in such a way like the Gentiles, like the Corinthians, like the Thessalonians in that culture lived, we do not know God. How do the nations who do not know God or know the Lord act? They act in the passions of their lust. This means that they have lustful desires in their heart and they carry out all these desires in sexual immorality. Here we see another blessing of knowing the Lord Jesus. Being made right with God through faith in Christ and grace. Since we know God, we are no longer enslaved to the bondage of sin. We are free. Free from the sexual bondage, the sexual immorality, the passions of the lust. We're free to live for the Lord Jesus in joy in Him. So we have God's will, holiness. Next we have God's punishment. And he goes in verse 6 and he says that no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter. Now for some people think, some people think that Paul has shifted gears here. Now he's going to speak about love, the issue of love. And then he goes back to it in 4 verse 9. But that's not really what's going on here. Although Paul is talking about the issue of love, what Paul is talking about is the consequences of sexual immorality. When you commit sexual immorality, you sin and wrong your brother. Often when people deal with the issue of committing adultery or sexual immorality, they say, well, that only affects me and the person and the two parties involved. It's only between two people. They've done what they've done. It's their business. No big deal. But when you commit sexual immorality, 
you sin against the person they are married to uh, married to and if they're not married then you're sinning against the person they will marry leon morris makes this ultra clear in his commentary on first thessalonians he says adultery is an obvious violation of the rights of another but promiscuity promiscuity before marriage represents the robbing of the other that virginity which ought to be brought to a marriage the future partner of such one has been defrauded we see another danger of sexual immorality here not only do we sin against the lord but we sin against other people and here we're given a warning because the lord is an avenger in all these things as we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you. This was a solemn warning. We see another sobering truth about sexual immorality. The Lord will punish such sins. We need to be clear here that there are people who never commit sexual immorality or adultery and that doesn't make them Christian. We don't want to say that. That everyone who, who lives an outwardly sexually pure life, boom, they're a Christian. Not saying that. But what Paul is getting at here though is if we persist in sin, that reveals that our faith is not genuine and then we're truly not Christians. The grace of God changes us. Does that mean that we're perfect? Does that mean that we'll never sin again? Absolutely not. But the grace of God changes and transforms us. So therefore we have the ability to turn from sin and walk in holiness. But if we persist in unrepentant, just diving into sin with joy, this reveals we do not know the Lord. We in fact are like the Gentiles who do not know God. But we do need to be warned here as well. The Lord punishes sin. This is something that Paul talks about many times. The Lord punishes sin. The Lord is the avenger of wrongs because he's a holy God who hates sin. One of the main reasons why the Old Testament, one of, there's many, the Old Testament is so important is because from Genesis to Malachi, it reveals to us and teaches us the important truth of the holiness of God. These books reveal to us that the Lord is holy. You see it so clear in Leviticus. The Lord is too pure to look upon sin. He cannot look upon sin with any sort of pleasure. Habakkuk 1.13 How many books in the Old Testament teach us that the Lord hates sin? Virtually almost all of them. But I think of Psalm 94 verse 1, whom Paul, whom Paul is probably quoting right here, this psalmist. O Lord, God of vengeance, O God of vengeance, shine forth. God is a God of vengeance who punishes sin. Paul, speaking about sexual immorality in Ephesians chapter 5, says, But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as it is proper among the saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, or crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be what? Thanksgiving. And he continues on here. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral, or impure, or who is covetous, that is an adulterer, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Here we even see that sexual immorality was linked to the culture of idol worship, which would have been the case in Thessalonica. In our culture, though, we're not necessarily bowing down to idols in the sense that they were but we bow down to the false gods of self-pleasure and self-gratification. Let that not be us, Christian. This truth of the holiness of God and God's hatred of sin is something that Paul has already mentioned to the Thessalonians and solemnly warned them about. So we have God's will, God's punishment, finally God's call. We're called to something different. We are, in 4 verse 7, not called for impurity, but holiness. In the midst of Paul's teaching on sexual purity, Paul brings us back to God's grace. It's wonderful. Paul reminds the Thessalonians that they are called by God. 
to be called by God means that you've been shown grace you don't deserve. This means that God has lavished upon you His Holy Spirit. You have new life. You are regenerated. You are revived. This means that by God's grace, it has been applied to you the benefits of Jesus and His work upon the cross. This means that you're transferred from the kingdom of darkness and brought to the kingdom of His beloved Son, the Lord Jesus. This means that by God's grace, your sins are forgiven, forgotten, remembered no more in the eyes of the Lord. Paul has already talked about this calling two previous times in chapter 1, verse 4. He says you're called... He also says it in 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 12. They're charged to walk in a manner worthy of God. God who calls you into his kingdom and glory. And it's this word calling is also used in 2 Thessalonians 2, 14. To this he called you through our gospel so that you may obtain the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. See the benefits there? We're called to live a life worthy of God. We're called to obtain the glory of Christ. They were saved and called by God, not for sexual immorality, impurity, or any sort of wickedness, but holiness. This is why they were called. They were called to be holy. Called in holy living. Called to holy living. They and us believers were called not to go back into sin, We've been delivered from it, but live lives that God has commanded us. And here how he ends this section. If you disregard these commands, you're not disregarding man, the pastor, Paul. You're disregarding God who gives us his Holy Spirit. If you're rejecting this teaching on God's design for marriage and committing sexual immorality, you are rejecting God. No one should think that this teaching is from just the Stone Age invented by people who wanted to keep their lives in order from cheating on, cheating on them. They wanted them as their own possession as they went and did their own thing. No, no one should think that sexual purity is an outdated teaching or way of life. This teaching comes from God, the very God who made you. And when you disregard God's teaching on sexual purity, you are disregarding God himself. And do you see how Paul ends this section on sexual purity? He reminds them that God has given them God, the Holy Spirit. And how important is the work of the Holy Spirit as we seek to be faithful to the Lord Jesus in this battle? The Holy Spirit is very important. We could talk about this Galatians 5, walk according to the Holy Spirit, have fruits of the Spirit in your life. No longer allow the fruits of sin to remain in your life. But that's the hope here in the promise. The Spirit of God has been given us to fight this battle. Application. Let's fight the sexual sins with the delights of knowing Christ. There are numerous blessings that are found in the Lord Jesus in 1 Thessalonians. You belong to the family of God. You're a brother in Christ. You're called into a relationship with God who created the universe. Your sin and your guilt are dealt with through Jesus Christ and his work upon the cross. Done. It is absolutely finished. And you have the hope of eternal life with God. Just look at later on in chapter 4 and verse 17. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So we will always be with the Lord. That's the promise of the gospel. We'll always be with the Lord. We need to speak to ourselves the glory of the Lord Jesus and his benefits. But on the flip side, it also helps us to see what happens if you go down to the path of sexual immorality. We can do a Dr. Phil moment here. How is that going to work out for you? This is something that Randy Alcorn talks about in his book, Purity Principle. He talks about, just go through the effects of sexual sin. Commit that adultery. See what's going to happen. See where that leads you. Broken family, sadness, pain with children, pain in the whole family. 
Over the last few years, I've seen the absolute harm of sexual immorality, dealing with a few friends who have decided to reject God's way for sexual purity. I don't need to give you the, any, any of the gory details, other than it ends up in absolute disaster. Disaster for everyone involved, and we haven't even included the children. If you want a biblical example of this, that's played out, read 2 Samuel verse uh, chapters 11 to 18. Things just become a disaster for David. And hear what happens to David. Hear what's said to him by God. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from your house, because you despised me and have taken the wife of the Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Avoid the pain of the end results of sexual immorality by fighting sin with the joy of the gospel of the Lord Jesus. When temptations come your way, look to Christ. Speak to yourself about the glories of Christ and cling to Christ in his beauties. Number two, what if you fail? We all know that this world is sex crazed. We just have to watch TV for just 10 minutes. Sexuality is just something that they toss around like we would toss around a baseball or kick around like we would kick a soccer ball. We in the church are not immune to these temptations and dangers of our, that are in our society. What if we've fallen? Come to Christ. Come to this gracious Lord. Think of the wonderful passage in 1 John chapter 1, verse 8. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to do what? To forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. These aren't the unforgivable sins. Come to Christ and be cleansed from all your unrighteousness. And if we say we haven't sinned, we make him to a liar and his word is not in us. My children, I'm writing these things to you that you may not sin. This is 2 verse 1 of 1 John. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus the righteous. He's the righteous one. He's the propitiation for our sins. He took the punishment for our sins and not only ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Do not be loaded down with guilt. Look to the beauty of Christ. He's called you. He's loved you. Next, finally, of course, we need to fight sexual sin, put it to death. When faced with temptation of sexual immorality, just like Joseph were to flee, we are to keep a distance. It says in Genesis 39, verse 12, She caught him, that's Potiphar's wife, by his garment, Joseph, saying, Lie with me. But he, Joseph, left his garment in her hand and fled and got out of the house. That word fled there is the word flee. It's the same word that's used in 1 Corinthians 6.18. And I'm pretty much convinced in my mind that Paul, when he's writing that, is thinking of Joseph using the same word, flee. It might not be a person you have to flee. Maybe it's a sexually charged TV show. Flee. Shut it off. Keep it at a distance. Maybe there's a person dressed inappropriately wherever. Flee and leave the area. Maybe there's something on the internet that leads you to lustful thoughts. And it might even lead you to sexual immorality. Flee and get off it. And if you've been saved by grace, God has called you. You've not been called to impurity in your life but holiness. Let us live for what the Lord has called us to. Holiness. Purity. Amen.